Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, good morning to those of you who are joining us from Hong Kong, and thank you all for being here. My name is Mike Babin, and I'm the president of the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association, and I'm proud to be the son of Alfred Babin, who was a Hong Kong veteran in the Royal Rifles of Canada. Tonight's topic is the Battle of Hong Kong, Myths and Memories, given by Dr. Brad St. Croix. I'll introduce our presenter in a moment, but first I'll get our administrative work out of the way with a very brief reminder about how this session will be conducted. And those of you who've done prior, prior sessions know all about this, so bear with me for a moment, but your camera and microphones are off, so feel free to enjoy that glass of wine because nobody can see you. You can ask questions at any time by using the Q&A function of Zoom which is, should be at the bottom of your screen, but if you don't see it there, you may have to tap on your screen or move your mouse to make it appear. Just type in your questions as you think of them. There's no need to wait until the end of the presentation. Your questions won't be answered right away, but we will get to them when our presenters have finished their talks. Please note that we're recording this event and the recording will be available on the HKVCA website, www.hkvca.ca. And don't hesitate to recommend that your family and friends watch it. Before we begin tonight's presentation, let's take a moment to reflect on a very recent and very sad event, the death of Hong Kong veteran George McDonnell last week. George was 100 years of age and the second last of our Hong Kong vets. Only one veteran now remains with us, Ormidas Fredette of New Minus, Nova Scotia, who was 106 years old. George was an outstanding storyteller who wrote several books about the battle and the Canadians who fought and died in it and who survived to spend so much time as prisoners of war under the worst imaginable conditions. He spoke countless times in schools, to service clubs and to the media about his own experiences and those of his colleagues. He often said, I mean, he often said about the Canadians in Hong Kong that they never surrendered. And this phrase was central to his storytelling and reflected his great pride in his countrymen and women and their behavior in the face of insurmountable challenge. He will truly be missed and we will remember them. Now to uh, our presentation for this evening. Of course, we're all proud of our relatives or friends who served in Hong Kong and rightfully so. But after Hong Kong fell, there were recriminations in Canada and in Great Britain. For example, why did Canada send troops when, as Churchill said, there was no hope of a victory? Were the troops properly trained? And if not, why not? Were they fighters or were they cowards? And after the return home, the debate continued. Tonight, we'll hear about these myths and memories and how they arose. Our presenter is Dr. Brad St. Croix. Brad earned his PhD in history from the University of Ottawa. His dissertation examined the legacy of the Battle of Hong Kong in Canada and myths about it. He's also written numerous articles about the Battle of Hong Kong for the Juneau Beach Center, the Canadian Military History Journal, and the Legion. He works with several organizations, including Project 44, the RCAF Foundation, and the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum, in creating military history content for their social media accounts. He's worked with the Canadian War Museum on multiple occasions. And he runs the OTD Canadian Military History online brand with social media accounts and a YouTube channel. And uh, just before the start of our session, Brad was just telling me that uh, later this week, uh, he'll be leading uh, a fairly large tour uh, of the battle sites in the Netherlands. So obviously a very qualified presenter. So Brad, we're ready for you. So please uh, go ahead. Thanks, Mike. And thanks for having me on. I uh, really appreciate it. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And for those of you watching later, um, again, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to present um, tonight and on this topic on my dissertation that I completed a few years ago now. So it was good to get back into it. And uh, especially given, again, the sad news of George's passing uh, last week or 
it's a timely part of this and we'll get to that in a, a bit of it uh, later on. So to begin, uh, we're gonna be, as Mike already said, focusing on several myths that have, and I've, as I've termed this multiple times, our understanding of the Canadians of the Battle of Hong Kong. Uh, so this is gonna be done in two parts. Uh, one, the first part will be uh, several myths, five in fact, while the second half of the presentation will be about uh, two main events, kind of as bookends to explain how the legacy in and of itself developed. So uh, uh, real quick off the top, I'll do a quick rundown of the myths themselves. So the myths are why were the Canadians sent to Hong Kong um, in relation to the British and Canadian armies uh, beginning in the First World War through to the second, uh, the defense of the co uh, colony of Hong Kong in and of itself, uh, the selection of the units of sea force, these units training, and finally their battlefield performance. Uh, the second part, as I said, We'll look at the memory of the battle and how that has developed right down to today um, with a part at the end talking about the, how the legacy has continued and continues to change. So these bookended uh, events are the 1942 Hong Kong Inquiry, which has a much longer name, going to go with the short version, and the 1992 uh, television miniseries episode on Hong Kong of the Valor and the Horror. So I will be looking at tonight is the uh, battle's negative legacy, how it's developed in Canada. A um, little bit connected to what happens in Britain, but mostly focusing on Canada. It's not a strict overview of the battle um, or the POW years. Um, others have done that and they've done it well. Um, so I would go suggest check those out. I know there's a lots of other great videos and other presentations from the association uh, and lots of other great literature on that. Um, if said, my focus will be more episodic connected to the five myths and how the legacy in and of itself developed. Um, some of these myths have been given more attention than others just because of time constraints and how I've organized the presentation. Uh, if you wish to dig deeper into any of these myths or topics that I um, cover tonight, again, feel free to answer, uh, put the questions in, we'll get to those at the end. Uh, but also my dissertation is publicly available. Um, if you search my name, Battle of Hong Kong and University of Ottawa, it'll pop right up and you can find it online. And I'm sure the link can be shared later as well, um, where you can really dig into it and where I talk about these things. So overall, what I would like to say is the myths that surround the Battle of Hong Kong and continue to today, um, I like to say they linger in the Canadian collective memory and they need to be disposed of. So a, just a general thread that runs through all of what I'll be talking tonight is the Canadian government in and of itself, and I mean that broadly, I don't mean a particular party or even a certain prime minister or any of that. I mean, just generally speaking, as this goes on for decades, is presented as a sort of an evil entity that was incompetent uh, with the dispatch of troops to Hong Kong. Uh, and therefore, they wanted to downplay the whole episode to kind of mitigate that PR damage. And as a result, the veterans themselves suffered from these decisions that were made. And we'll get into why all of that happened the way it did. So the first myth is that Canada had no connection to Hong Kong and therefore they should not be there. They should not have been there to defend it in the first place. There is no seemingly tangible connection at the time in 1941 between Canada and Hong Kong or even the Far East really in general which there was, but I think in what I've looked at in and of itself is besides the point because Canada and Canadians at the time, especially those in charge of the Canadian army, didn't see it that way. They, see, they saw the British Empire and Canada as not necessarily one and the same, but very much aligned while some did so, thought so because they wanted to benefit Canada, while others just genuinely believed that was good for the empire was good for Canada and what needed to be done for the empire, Canada would do. So that I think in and of itself does a lot to undo this myth because it's not just seen as a geographic connection or anything like that. I argue this myth ignores vital context uh, and the British Canadian relationship, particularly their armies and the interwar period. And I went into more detail about that in the dissertation, but it is fascinating some of the connections you do see that start in the First World War and into these decision makers that lead to 
those who go to Hong Kong and also those who make the decision to send to Hong Kong. So generals like Arthur Curry, Andrew McNaughton, and Henry Criar, who are all big important names in the Canadian inner war, sorry, the Canadian army in the inner war years, but also in the early years of the second world war, have an impact on this because they do believe in this connection. They believe in a strong link to the British empire will benefit Canada, uh, mostly in that case, that's McNaughton, but individuals like Criar, in and of itself, sorry, believe that in and of itself that that connection was something to be upheld and to strengthened. So part of this myth is that Canada was duped or portrayed by Britain into re reinforcing uh, Hong Kong, that perfidious Albion kind of idea, which in and of itself is not true, generally speaking, but also for this myth itself. The Canadian decision was a Canadian decision. It was not just something the British made them do. And I argue this is because of all these connections with Harry Criar, who spent time working in the war office, uh, very strong connections to lots of individuals in the British Army and in the British government. Um, and when it comes time for uh, a decision to be made with the termed infamous uh, September 1941 telegram from the Dominion's office asking the Canadian government to send reinforcements to Hong Kong, I say it arrived in a very fertile environment with a long-standing and intimate cultural and military relationship between Canada and Britain. So to say that there is no connection, it just doesn't really fit. So, and again, it was a Canadian decision to do this, but it was done within an empire context. It's not the empire telling the Canadians what to do, but the Canadians within said empire doing so. So the second myth is also connected to the British Empire and the colony in and of itself of Hong Kong. Uh, this one revolves around the idea of Hong Kong was deemed indefensible well before the Canadian reinforcement, and then that C4 should never have been sent in the first place. One thing I learned through this process of my dissertation is the one constant in the defense planning for Hong Kong was change. Near constant change from the beginning, um, even before you know, Hong Kong becomes a technical British colony, there's dis dis debates, discussions about what's going on. People who are in Hong Kong have different opinions from those back in Britain. And this goes on for nearly 100 years. Political battles and second guesses are par for the course for this. And the Canadian reinforcement is just one of the last parts of this overall, particularly entering into 1941. So when different individuals, be it historians, journalists, writers, discuss the defense of Hong Kong in relation to sea force, uh, and before the Japanese attack itself, um, they quote Churchill, and, and Mike mentioned that before we began. Um, and Churchill was said, sorry, um, said in January of 1941 that, and I quote, this is all wrong. If Japan goes to war with us, there is not the slightest chance of holding Hong Kong or relieving it. It is most unwise to increase the loss we shall suffer there. Instead of increasing the garrison, it ought to be reduced to a symbolic scale. So yes, Churchill said so. He said that in 1941. And I repeat the date because that is important. This is a crucial time, particularly for the Allies in the Second World War. Again, constant. the one constant is change. And, and that is no different once the Second World War begins. So at the beginning of 41, when Churchill says this, in the technicalities of war is the British Commonwealth and Empire faces Nazi Germany alone. But by the end of the year, that has changed greatly. The Soviet Union gets invaded in June 1941, becomes an ally of Britain, and is fighting the Nazis to this, fighting obviously on the Eastern Front. But also the American aid has vastly increased over 1941. America was not involved in the war technically until the attack on Pearl Harbor, even though the American Navy was involved in a shooting war with the U-boats on the Atlantic, but also things like Lemley's and all of that had ramped up that had started to have an impact. So the situation had changed. Things had become better for the allies in that sense. We have to remember that at the time, the players don't know things are about to get a lot worse before they get better. They think things are on the rise. And as we know, that's not the case. Also, one thing that is completely, I would say, ignored almost in all of the literature that I looked at is those in Hong Kong have a very different opinion than those in Britain, and those in Hong Kong are calling for reinforcement constantly. And this is beginning, takes place even before the Second World War breaks out in September 1939. Uh, 
Uh, Brigadier Edward Gresset, Gresset, sorry, was the commander of Hong Kong from 1938 to September 1941. He is there just before all of this happens when uh, Brigadier Maltby takes over. Gresset had asked for reinforcement pretty much from the beginning of when he took over in, in any shape or form. Uh, he wanted anything he could get, more troops, more guns, even aircraft. At one point, he even asked for empty crates that they would ship aircraft in to try and trick the Japanese into thinking that the colony was better garrisoned in the air than it actually was. And he's rebuffed every time. Every time he's told no. So it's not until that, that Gresset comes through Canada on his way back to Britain after being relieved by Maltby that any of his attempts prayer any fruit because he meets with Harry Criar, who at the time is the chief of the general staff of the Canadian Army. After that, Gressa goes through back to Britain, has his meeting with the War Office, convinces them that Canada will provide them, provide the troops that are necessary that he's been calling for for years at that point. And then that leads back to September 19th, 41 telegram asking for Canadian reinforcements and also connects to our third myth. Well, again, the Canadian acceptance of Britain's request to reinforce Hong Kong is the third myth. The decision has often been presented as a cold-blooded sacrifice of Canadian troops so that the Canadian government or specific individuals within it or within Britain, or again, it's all very shadowy and confusing, could benefit from the situation. Um, this one, again, is, is a bit not, as again, I should have said at the beginning, a lot of these myths have really no actual ground to stand on and are connected to a whole bunch of other things that unfortunately we cannot get into tonight, but that is important to keep in mind about these myths. So this whole cold-bloodedness and political calculation is, is not the case. There's much more going on here than saying reinforcing colony at one moment in time. There's individuals who have different priorities and Hong Kong comes through, the Hong Kong request comes through. I'm where things have changed in the war, also things are, a little unsettled in Canada, um, particularly when it comes to uh, Prime Minister um, William Lyon Mackenzie King. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of him at the time to do more. You have to remember at this point, the Canadian Army has not been involved in fighting the enemy at all. Shots, as they say, have been fired in anger by a Canadian soldier yet. So there is lots of pressure within Canada to get something done, to do anything, and particularly a very strong call for overseas conscription. Again, that is completely missing from the historiography on this topic, is the concerns over conscription. So it is in this environment that in the summer of 1941, the Globe and Mail out of Toronto, a notoriously anti-King newspaper, present, uh, prints a series of articles uh, and said to be done in a, in, a, in a spirit of helpfulness to help the Canadian war effort giving lessons about what can be done and cannot be done to do make do such things. Cough conscription several times. They wanted an increase in the war effort. They tried to argue how it should be done uh, and all of that. So it, it is within this environment, obviously, and King, who is wary of all kinds of things, but conscription probably being at the top of the list for most of the war, because he fears that it will affect his power base. That was Quebec in the war because of First World War, you have the conscription crisis with the rioting and, and all the problems that caused for the Liberal Party. So that's at his, uh, at the top of his mind. And, and this isn't just me saying this, he literally writes this down. Um, and his, you know, the diaries that are very accessible online. Um, so once this, upper, sorry, once this telegram comes through, it gives King an opportunity to show that more can be done by Canada without running the risk of creating a situation that could lead to overseas conscription. It's only two battalions. It's not enough that that would strip Canada at home for home defense. It wouldn't strip the uh, troops overseas in Britain at the time, because again, it's only two battalions that were in Canada when the decision was made. So King jumps on this opportunity uh, once it's presented to him. So there's no conspiracy to put Canadian troops in harm's way at Hong Kong. Mistakes were made. And one uh, I do highlight is there is a complete lack of an independent Canadian intelligence inquiry into any of this. They had the means to do so and just never did it. Um, that is one thing that they did critically wrong that they could have done, but didn't. It's no conspiracy, it's no anything like that. 
So there, like I said, there's numerous personal, political, cultural factors going on. I mean, the Golden Mail articles use hockey to try and convince people to get them to do more for the war uh, that play a part in this dispatch of Canadians to the distant colony and to the distant colony on the other side of the world. Oh, the fourth myth is that the troops of Sea Force were poorly trained for combat. The selection of the Royal Rifles of Canada and the Winnipeg Grenadiers became extremely controversial uh, pretty much immediately after the battle because of the supposed lack of training. Writers and historians since have claimed that the Canadian Army itself said both the Royal Rifles and Grenadiers were not recommended for selection to go to Hong Kong. While this is technically true, this misses a very vital, and I can't stress the word vital enough, context of this entire situation. So how was Seaforce put together? That is something that's misunderstood, sometimes not even discussed in say books on this or articles, it's, it's just kind of left out. So the process literally starts with making a list of all the active service battalions in Canada and their place categories based on their fitness to serve overseas. So the first list was assembled by Lieutenant Colonel H.A. Sparling, a staff officer and the director at military training. He places them into three classes. A, B, not recommended. Based on their progress of training and service as of August 1941, the last full reports that they had available. Both the Grenadiers and Royal Rifles were placed in the not recommended list. The list was further sent on to the Directorate of Staff Duties for further consideration. So during the 1942 inquiry, numerous individuals are, are brought to testify, and Sparling is one of them. And we'll get to that in a little bit, the inquiry overall in a little bit. So Sparling is very heavily questioned, um, and he's pressed numerous times about the battalions of Seaforce and their level. He says that the units that were sent to Hong Kong were actually better trained than the 2nd Division battalions that went overseas to England in the summer of 1940. Uh, as for the individual and collective training, uh, Sparling contended that the Royal Rifles and Grenadiers were equal to any other unit in Canada. Uh, the fact that he had no concerns with either unit um, having to do with discipline or anything he saw in these training reports. And he was asked, and when asked, and I quote, if so, if these two battalions did not get any training, they were not, they were not at, at no disadvantage as against other battalions in Canada, was a question. And Starling replied, uh, they were in exactly the same position. So everyone is the same. All the battalions are basically at the same level. And these two are no different. So he's again pressed, why, then why are these two selected if they're on the not recommended list? So Sparling states that there had been a policy in place that a unit that had returned from overseas duty, and at this point that includes Newfoundland, um, refresher training. And he said, if they had done that, they would have been on the A list because they had just returned from both, of, both of them had just returned from these garrison duties. And this was a standard procedure at the beginning of the war. Uh, and therefore these two units were not in the A list. So technically, yes, they are put into this non-recommended category, but it's not because of lack of training for combat at the levels that became uh, standard for 1941, which are different, right? A lot of people like to project on say 1944, that's different than the, you know, the standards of 1941. So it's this context that is, vitally important to understanding this and has just completely missed in every um, article or book I read about this. So the final myth, it's a little more nuanced and complicated, I guess is the best way to say it. So the fifth and final myth has two parts, both related to the Canadian performance in battle. Uh, it consists of the idea that the Canadians were ill-disciplined fighters whose poor performance led to Hong Kong's fall. And then in opposition of that is that the Canadians were the best fighters in the whole of the garrison and could do no wrong. Uh, I argue for middle path. Neither of these myths are accurate in representing the reality of the situation. The troops of Sea Force were given a task to carry out to the best of their abilities under extremely difficult circumstances. Force's performance did not rank below the other units that fought at Hong Kong, nor were Canadians the superior fighting force within this multinational force at all. 
and present in the fighting. I, I'd say they, the units that did most of the fighting performed extremely well given the circumstances. That includes Indian units, British units, Canadian units, and the local defense forces. They all performed extremely well. So to say that one is better than the other ignores the situation and the reality left by the documents and sources that we have left. So I wasn't going to originally include this, but I think it's important based on what Mike mentioned earlier with the passing of George McDonnell not too long ago. I spoke with him um, over two years ago now uh, about his experiences and the fighting in and of itself. And he was very gracious with his time and the details he provided me because I wanted to, I've written numerous times on the Christmas Day assault of D Company of the Royal Rifles uh, and their assault on Stanley Village. And of course, part of D Company. Uh, so D Company, and sorry, before we begin, you can just see this is the map from the official history. And this is taking place down here. And I'll just leave this up for a minute. I have a better map in a moment, but I, it's good to look at this map to get a context of what had happened. So D Company is ordered to push the Japanese out of Stanley Village, which had just had just been taken in a daylight daylight attack. Uh, the Japanese were encroaching on East Brigade headquarters, which again, as you can see, is located on Stanley Peninsula uh, near the Stanley Fort. As was a constant throughout the whole battle, the need to counterattack and push the Japanese off the high ground to find this battle, and this was no different on the 25th. However, the tactical usefulness at this point of pushing the Japanese off another piece of high ground had been far outstripped by the collapse of the strategic situation. As you can see here at these far extremities, these are the front lines on the 20th. The situation had completely deteriorated. So regardless of this, due to a whole series of factors, communications being cut off one of them, the attack went ahead. So, uh, so, Mac, so George McDonnell was tasked with leading his platoon. He's only a sergeant at this time. Uh, as all the other officers in that platoon had been killed or wounded. So he recalls thinking, and this is available in his book, the sheer stupidity of the order to send us with our artillery, mortar, or machine gun support into a village full of Japanese in broad daylight was not last on me. The Japanese heavily outnumbered D Company. Um, the estimates of Japanese strength ranged, for, sorry, ranged from a I'm sorry, brigade's worth, to only 15 soldiers and all kinds of numbers in between. Um, those low estimates were very far off. Sorry, DU Company strength, again, there's different estimates from those involved, around 120, 130 soldiers at the time of the attack. I had this map made up by Mike Bechtold, who's a great map maker, great historian in and of himself. Um, so again, thanks to Mike for this amazing map that's part of my dissertation as well, and an article I wrote for the Legion out of BC. It's, it's a well-done map and shows the attack, uh, how it develops. So that artillery and heavy machine gun support was promised, but never materialized. As you can see on app, uh, number 16 platoon attacks on the right, literally hugging the coast and moving a little bit inland when the situation determined it, while platoon 17 and 18 attacked on the left through the cemetery. So the advance on the right makes very little headway and pin is pinned down very, very quickly. Numerous decks. Attack, and they're given the order to retreat almost immediately because they can't get through the heavy Japanese fire on the right hand side. So attacking on the left flank, uh, McDonnell's platoon came under enemy fire almost immediately because they're exposed in the low ground. Uh, but they were able to advance across and through the cemetery without any casualties by doing short rushes, using whatever cover they could find. Uh, George mentioned ditches, um, a broken down car anything like that. So they were able to make it to the outer perimeter of the village with no casualties. And they had to do a bayonet charge to achieve this. And George described to me them fixing bayonets and just screaming anything as they charge across the field. So this, they were able to take the Japanese by surprise and push them out of the cemetery in a confused, and I quote here, the confused and bloody melee of hand-to-hand -hand fighting with bayonets took place to push them out the Japanese out of the cemetery. So Magdanel enters the village after clearing the Japanese troops of the first row of the bungalows that dominate the high ground, as you can see here in A, B, and C. He's able to push them out with use of grenades. Um, 
So those with him are able to move forward into the village and as the Japanese actually fall back further in, as you can see here in D, uh, closer to the main heart of the village. Um, but it's at this point, the Japanese are able to bring their numbers to bear. Um, everything goes quiet after a little while, after the Japanese have caused numerous Canadian casualties. Uh, and and George MacDonald orders the platoon to occupy positions in and around the first line of houses, the A, B, and C bungalows. Very short lull ensues uh, when the artillery opens up. Uh, the Japanese artillery opens up on the bungalows uh, and they try to hold on as best they can, uh, but they're running out of ammunition. Uh, and as George stressed to me multiple times, the importance of water in combat, uh, multiple times. He, or I knew that and to tell people that when I, when I tell this story, uh, that the water had run out and they had taken several casualties. Um, so again, the lull is very short lived, only about 20 minutes, uh, and the Japanese start to move forward and start to encircle the bungalows and start. Now it gets hears here from a runner that they've been ordered to retreat, which he does. Um, and to say it's done in good order would be false. Um, numerous casualties have to be left behind because they can't get them out because of the fire. So the company loses 26 killed and 75 wounded in this attack. Uh, the members of D Company displayed remarkable discipline to attack an enemy on the high ground without any protection or support. But unfortunately, bravery was not enough to take and hold this position. So uh, why I want to tell that is kind of, of course, in honor of George, who shared his time and his experiences with me openly. Um, but it shows that the Canadians had the bravery um, they had some of the some of them had the skills to do so, and they were able to improvise and, and do all of that and the necessary things to provide be successful in combat. But they were just simply outnumbered, and, and the attack fails. And this is just one example. Can't go into them all tonight, obviously. But um, there are some things that from the Canadian contingent that don't go so well. So, despite this bravery and skillful use of tactics, there's instant, lots of instances, of poor, unfortunately, of poor discipline. Um, such as drunkenness, um, again, not 100% confirmed, but from the source I was able to find, I don't know why that individual, a Canadian officer, a Canadian officer being drunk at the front line. Importantly, that comes up multiple times across the front is um, subunits, so say a section, routinely fell back without orders when no officer or senior NCO was present. That happened often. So that's kind of showing that the losses that had been suffered had an impact and discipline wasn't hundred percent, you know, tight at all times. So I, I contend that the Canadian performance during the battle was decidedly mixed in that regard. Um, there's a, no doubt of the will to fight, um, but the Canadians, some of them lacked necessary skills. There's an unfortunate uh, situation where most of them didn't know how to use the grenades that they were issued. But despite these flaws, this, the scrutiny of Sea Force's fighting performance and a number of sources is very unfair. The Canadians fighting in Hong Kong did the best they could under their circumstances. While not supermen, they were neither terrible troops that caused the downfall of the colony. So we will now move on to, excuse me, how the legacy in and of itself starts to develop. And that actually takes place during, starts actually during the war in and of itself, only a few months after the fall of the colony. So this is, I've again termed the Hong Kong inquiry. You can see that the actual name is, is much more complicated than that. So I didn't want to just keep saying that. But this inquiry was perhaps one of the earliest attempts to shape the legacy of the battle on a large scale and where many of the myths about the Canadian performance and participation in the defense of the colony uh, stem from. This is the Canadian, many Canadians first introduction to what had happened in, in a sense, right? Again, this is during the war. No one who's present at Hong Kong is present in the inquiry. They're still all prisoners of war as this is taking place in 1942 in the early, uh, early to late spring when this is all going on. So no one who was there could take part. Um, but things about what happened before are discussed at length um, in the press at the time, but also afterwards when the report is officially released. Uh, so many of these um, myths, these are their first instance of the, for the Canadian public, um, such as accusations of government incompetence, uh, the supposed poor training, 
um, his poor British attitudes towards the Canadians is the best way I can frame that. Uh, and also just widespread media attention um, that solely focuses on the Battle of Hong Kong. So important is the king's government and king of himself wanting to make this whole episode basically disappear. Uh, the inquiry becomes comes to life because of Mackenzie King's hope that he could dispel concerns um, that were raised about the dispatch and loss of sea force repeatedly in the House of Commons at the time. He was hoping that this could undo all those concerns and kind of make it quietly go away. Fortunately for him and, and again, as all of those involved in the veterans when they come home, this doesn't happen. And in fact, King made the situation so much worse than it need be. So the inquiry basically, as I understand it, and in my opinion, based on research, is an exercise in passing blame for the dispatching of Canadian troops to Hong Kong. So the inquiry is led by Lyman Duff, who at the time was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He's asked by King to do it personally. Um, he's originally reluctant to do so because of health reasons and other political connected reasons, as Duff was a lifelong liberal. Um, it raises all kinds of concerns once this report is released. Uh, and agrees to do so. Uh, however, in his report, um, Duff basically absolves King's government of any blame whatsoever. Uh, blame for anything. Uh, the only blame he really places on is the logistics branch and having to do with the placement of truck. Yeah. So contemporary conservative politicians, uh, plus future historians and authors, have labeled the inquiry a whitewash. Uh, such claims do possess some merit um, because the intention of the inquiry was to make the episode disappear, the Hong Kong episode disappear, but uh, as I said, it does not happen. Oh, one of these politicians, and as I've labeled him, a, the classic Ontario politician, George Drew. Oh, there's Mackenzie King there. Sorry about that. I'm sure we're all aware of what he looks like. <laughs> we're so familiar with this gentleman, George Drew. Um, so during the inquiry, the opposition, so the opposition in, in uh, the House of Commons, the Conservatives were able to appoint a council to cross-examine any witnesses. Um, Support, and they nominated George Drew, uh, an Ontario provincial politician at the time, later becomes uh, federal head, uh, sorry, head of the federal conservative party in parliament. So Drew makes sure that the battle's remembered by his actions, um, but negatively. So there's all kinds of exchanges during the inquiry of Duff and Drew basically just yelling at each other. You can see it in the notes. It's, it's quite comical if it wasn't so sad and so important of what happens between these two. However, what King does to make all of this worse is after the fact, King has Drew arrested uh, after the inquiry in relation to comments Drew made in June 1942, uh, saying that these comments were unlawful. And I quote, uh, a statement or reference with respect to the report of the Crown, of the Crown Colony of Hong Kong, likely to prejudice the recruiting of His Majesty's forces contrary to the defense of Canada regulations. So he say, so Drew basically says in public multiple times uh, that Duff ignored evidence outright, reached conclusions without evidence, uh, and that the proceedings were held in camera or in private, not with any press, allow Duff to reach whatever conclusions the King government wanted to make. So Drew is charged, the charges are quickly dropped after it becomes a bit of a PR disaster for King. Um, and, uh, again, if it wasn't so sad and what the events it involves, a comical political farce on both sides. And this one, it, it, it's quite the episode that to discover and piece all of this together it took some quite a long time to do. So Prime Minister King's seeking to limit the battle's effects on politics basically undoes all of that. Um, he wants it to dismiss all doubts about government negligence and competence, but it completely fails. Uh, it brings just more attention to the battle and itself negative attention before the veterans even get home, those who survive. So accordingly, Drew attacks King's government for years, uh, particularly once he enters the House of Commons. Uh, he would bring it up out of nowhere um, 
and did it even when uh, Louis Saint Laurent took over as prime minister. This continues on basically until Drew's death. He's writing letters to people uh, in his later years about all of this. So this sours Sea Force and the Hong Kong veterans in King's eyes, also other members of the Liberal Party. So in the post-war years, little changed as government and military officials sought to sideline Sea Force's experiences at Hong Kong and in the POW camps. There was a few benefits that came out of these political battles, um, particularly in the early years when the Hong Kong veterans got home. We'll get to that in a moment, but this period cemented the battle as a politically sensitive topic that many governments since King have sought to downplay. And that goes for both liberal and conservative governments. The, negative, the negativity, sorry, around the Battle of Hong Kong created by the inquiry has continued to this day. So, and what's been termed by others and still used by me as the third battle, the first being the actual battle itself, the second being the struggle of the POWs, and the third battle being what the veterans had to do when they came home. So another example of the negativity associated with the battle is the poor treatment of the Hong Kong veterans by the Canadian government. And again, as I say, when I say Canadian government, I mean multiple administrations from both parties. No government is blameless here as this goes on for decades. I believe such treatment contributed to the negative legacy of the Battle of Hong Kong in Canada. So two early issues revolve around Pacific campaign pay, which they were veterans were initially denied, and even the right to wear the Pacific Star, which was only supposed to apply to veterans who fought in, against Japan starting in 1945. Um, it was denied originally, but some wrangling in Parliament, eventually they are given the right to do so. But this is just the beginning of the poor treatment. So as those who came back and those who survived the POW years struggled mightily, um, there's all kinds of writings on this. Quite a few of them have stuck out to me. Uh, William Allister's is the one that has stuck out to me. Um, and death, uh, where life and death hold hands. If you haven't read that, I highly suggest so. So just one quote from his book that has really stuck with me is, and I quote, there was no counseling, no advice, no awareness that we might act or feel any differently. It was sink or swim, you're on your own, boys. You're on your own, boys. Like good Canadians, we expected nothing, got nothing. We were paid off in a lump sum. Four years back pay shoved in the, in the pocket of my battle address. In five days, it landed me on the train home, stomach inflamed, fingers trembling, nerves shot. So many veterans suffered from psychological issues and general poor health for years. Um, like I said, numerous of them had issues integrating back into civilian society. Um, Charles Rowland, who wrote on the medical history of, of, of the veterans, said often they return home to dislocated families and have to struggle to cope with a world significantly changed from the one they knew before captivity. Uh, and, and there's this is seen again in all multiple ways that this OW experience had changed so many of those that came home. So in a particular piece that stands out um, to me from July 1968 in McLean's, talking about Hong Kong. It's one of the earliest articles in the post-war period that looks at this in any detail. It lays out government and military callousness towards Hong Kong veterans. It's written by Ian Adams and covers themselves. This is quoting Adams in the article. In the years since World War II, the Canadian government has acted as if it wished the Hong Kong survivors would just go away. And unfortunately, I agree with him in that sense. A sharp anecdote concluded the article, and this is quoting from here again. When McLean's began researching the, this article, we started at the historical section of the Department of National Defense. There, in an interview with real, uh, researcher Philip Forsyth Smith, Colonel DJ Goodspeed, who was an official historian at the time, said, and again, I quote, if you get around to talking to surviving, surviving veterans of the Hong Kong battle, you must appreciate that these all these men are a little balmy after their experience in the POW camps. Therefore, don't put too much stock into what they have to say. As I said, Goodspeed is a D&D historian and a government official. So this is an extreme callousness to say so. And this carries a lot of weight in this opinion because he's a government official and writing official histories at the time and before. So this is just showing what's going on inside the Canadian government. 
but also Goodspeed's not the first one to say something like that from within D&D. So W.H.S. Macklin, who at the time was the Adjutant General of the Canadian Army, called the POWs debris of war's past and a waste of time for D&D &D in 1950. So this again is showing this callousness, but why I also think Mal Macklin says so is he was part of the selection of Seaforth. He was part of the de uh, Department of uh, Personnel at the time. And he's part of this. He was one of the ones who reviewed the list. So I think he's trying to downplay this to downplay his own part in it. So as I'm sure some of you are aware, the, and I know some of you are, veterans had to fight for benefits for decades. I can just do a real quick interview over that. Um, one of the first is a medical review done by Dr. H.J. Richardson, who looks at the POWs and see in, uh, in 19, the early 1960s, sorry, uh, and notes that hardly any of them had no disability due to their POW experience. Uh, only 5% at the time claimed no disability. Uh, the rest claimed some sort of disability. A uh, high number of deaths at the time to heart disease were alarming to Richardson. Um, as other conditions as well. Um, he, actually he actually suggested that the government reinvestigate old claims uh, about those who had died from heart-related issues that were said not to be part of their experiences as POWs and have those pension files reopened. That's not the only medical um, survey that's done after um, in the years after, as again, some of you are, should be aware, I'm not sure who's watching, some may have been involved, but in, in 1985, the War of Mutations of Canada and the Hong Kong Veterans Association undertook a general study of C4 veterans health to put a claim before the United Nations to hold Japan monetarily responsible for its wartime actions. Dr. Gustav Gingras was asked to look at 400 veterans files, uh, obtain compensation uh, for them or for their widows, for their slave labor. And just real quick, he listed all of the conditions that the veterans were suffering from. These included gastrointestinal, foot, oral, orthopedic, spinal, cardiovascular, respiratory, and urogenital issues. And vitamosis, vitamin deficiency, psychiatric issues, neurological impairment, and social problems were also prominently noted. And Gingras concluded, it is strongly believed that the surviving XPOWs are fragile persons and more prone to suffer from a variety of physical, psychiatric, and social disorders than so-called normal members of the general population. So, and, and Gingras conducts interviews with several veterans. And again, some of these lines have stuck with me um, and since research years ago. Um, Basically, he just asked them one question. Is it your feeling that the incarceration in a Japanese prison camp has jeopardized your physical and mental health? So some of the ones that have stuck out to me, um, uh, Leo Sears said the four years of captivity took 10 years off his life. Walter Gray said he had to retire early from the post office at 51 due to poor health. Um, at the time, many of them said that there was little to no change to their mental health. Uh, but some of their answers say otherwise. Um, I think this has to do with an ongoing, including today, stigma surrounding mental health issues might explain such uh, answers, but some of them may not just generally have suffered mental health issues, uh, but some of these answers stand out and that some of them did. Um, so Frank Harding, when asked that question I just read, uh, answered physically, yes. Mentally, I would say it has affected my relationship with my family. Maybe I am different. I don't know that he had to give up a supervisory position due to bad nerves. Uh, John Simcoe answered, yes, I may appear calm, but never, I I'm never am. And I've been that way ever since. I have a great deal of apprehension and anxiety. If I am faced with stress, I become very tense. I'm not what I should be. So they were also asked, uh, some of them, uh, if they thought their ex fellow ex-POWs were aging faster than the average veteran. Uh, Gene uh, Matchett felt his memory was affected for his older brother had a much better memory than him. Uh, Burton again believed that some former POWs had died too soon during their years due to their years in captivity. 
but he believed that their death rates resembled those of veterans past age 60. Uh, and this one is one that's been used as a book title and has stuck out in many other articles it is by Joseph Gursky pointedly responded, not only do they age fast, they are dying sooner. So all that to say this submission to the UN uh, is made in 1987 and is rejected. Uh, as the peace treaty that took place in 1952 with Japan and the allies had included payments for the slave labor, the Canadian and Japanese government considered the matter closed. So the Canadian government provided no support uh, so this was done through the UN Human Rights Council, uh, or sorry, committee. Uh, they had found that the veterans had not exhausted the domestic options to resume further compensation. Also, the UN had no way to force the Japanese to pay. So in 1993, the Hong Kong veterans pushed the Canadian government to provide compensation if Japan would not. Five years later, the government compensated surviving veterans and 400 widows with 24,000 each. This quoted from the newsletter. Uh, while satisfied with the amount, veterans were, I quote, upset about the about that, sorry, upset that the money had to come from Canadian taxpayers instead of the Japanese government. Further, in kind of putting a bookend on this, further surviving C4 veterans were told in 2001 they would receive all of them would receive 100 percent pension coverage. A decision that comes way too late, as most of the veterans had passed away by that point. So oh, such a difficult journey for more benefits for Hong Kong veterans demonstrates the real world negative impacts that this legacy has had. So moving into the last little bit here. So the valor and the horror um, has had a major impact. Current understanding of the Battle of Hong Kong. So the episode that focuses on Hong Kong is called Savage Christmas. It covers the battle and the POW years. Uh, the episode spread the negative legacy of the battle to the largest audience in decades. Furthermore, media attention after the fact spreads more misconceptions in, in news and editorials and all of that uh, that are presented in the series, again, further causing more damage. So the episode begins in a very, I think, strange way and also with an outright blatant lie. And again, quoting from the episode. This is a true story. In some cases, actors speak the documented words of soldiers and nurses. There is no fiction. Not true. Objectively false. The episode is full of lies, made up scenarios, and assumptions. One such claim the filmmakers made was that details of what happened to these soldiers were for a long time suppressed by the Canadian government, and the terrible story is known to few Canadians. It's clearly not true, as the 1942 inquiry talks about this stuff at length in the national press four months. Um, so that's just not true. And, and again, there's other things that I cover in my dissertation that it's kind of like an ebb and flow. There's comes up again and again and again in years. Um, well, this is just not true. Um, they call the decision to send Canadians to Hong Kong an imperial conspiracy concocted in London and then approved by Ottawa. And as I talked about, that's not true. One egregious situation to me is they make up a scenario involving Sergeant John Payne of the Grenadiers. Um, where he's said to be at uh, Mylon Passage, or sorry, at Mylon uh, Point, um, actually, sorry, in the fort at Mylon, where the Japanese officially, sorry, initially make their landings uh, on the island of itself. He's presented as an actor portraying him, uh, telephoning headquarters, reporting the landings, denied artillery support. And then again, he says that uh, a J British officer said the Japanese could not possibly be on the island. And the actor says, we're commanded by these British imperial types. Some of them just don't trust us colonials. He actually told me I must be dreaming. This doesn't happen. That never happens. That's not documented. Pain is nowhere near the landings. Uh, I believe they use pain in this situation as they want to connect to um, uh, this scene, later mention of pain and others execution at the hands of the Japanese for a failed POW escape. Uh, and I believe this is just one of the many ways that the filmmakers wanted to manipulate emotions uh, and did so whatever means necessary to bolster their anti-government agenda. So, and then again, as I'm sure some of you are aware, there are subsequent multiple investigations into the valor and the horror. And again, these myths just get spread further and further and further through the press. Claims of this series, I see it myself when I talk to people, um, 
when I when they asked me what I was doing my dissertation on, some of them would almost directly quote from the valor and the horror. Some would say things that come from the valor and the horror without realizing it. And this is still taking place 31 years later. So it's a bit of a concerning situation. There's a photo I took of the Memorial Wall, one of my places I like to visit often in Ottawa where I live. Um, oh, there has been efforts to change how the battle is viewed in the recent past. Um, the Memorial Wall, and obviously, as most of you know, by the association. Um, and again, I'm, I wasn't there at the time. I wish I had been, but at uh, the dedication. Um, and just some of the words have, have, have stuck with me about wanting to remember what happened. It's just about remembrance, casting aside the political fighting, the fighting in the media, wanting to have remembrance. And Phil Doddridge, of course, who was also no longer with us at the time, remarked, and so until this stone disintegrates and returns to dust, we will be remembered. Again, another line. About that remembrance and having that as something as the, the focus instead of all of the things behind it, the negativity. So yeah, I think this is a great example of how something like legacy can be changed, how it can be reevaluated, how it can be refocused. And having all of the veterans' names who served as part of C-Force, I think is a great way to do that. So in preparation for this um, presentation this evening, uh, I was given a question ahead of time, which I greatly appreciate. So thanks, Mike, for doing so um, from one of the viewers um, about the display at the Canadian War Museum, a place I know well. I visit it constantly, <laughs> worked there multiple times, as was said already. I don't currently work for them, um, so I don't have any, you know, I, I don't work for them. I'm just representing myself here. So uh, I was asked about the general tone and, and how does it changed since the opening of the new location of the War Museum in 2005? The answer is no, it remains the same, it has not changed. It, it has a negative overarching uh, narrative part of it. There's hardly anything there. Um, unfortunately, the photo I had, I didn't get a very detailed photo, I apologize. Um, but the, the little quick blurb just says the same things you've heard a thousand times when it comes to the Sea Force. They're under equipped, under trained, didn't do a very good job, did their best, and were defeated. Um, so, and again, you can see it just says defeat at Hong Kong. Okay. Historians, both while working there and after, uh, about the, the display, the, the current World War II historian had nothing to do with it. He wasn't working there at the time. But as far as I'm aware, there are no plans to change this gallery or this panel at all. I, for the question and comment that I had received, this is an opportunity to change how the battle is viewed because this is viewed by a lot of people. A lot of people, even now after, not after COVID, but after the shutdowns, um, a lot of people stop and read this because I've seen them do it. Um, and a lot of people do. So I think this could be an opportunity to reevaluate the legacy and have an impact because so many people do come through this section and do read about the battle. Maybe they're only exposure to it at all. So it's an opportunity to change how the battles viewed and how those are fought, uh, those who fought in it. So that's all I have for the formal presentation. Can I hear you, Mike? All right, it, it always works better if I turn my microphone on. <laughs> it, it helps a little, yes. <laughs> it does. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there was a lot in your presentation um, and, and I certainly learned a lot and I have a few questions, but some of our viewers have uh, questions too. So Elizabeth wants to know, um, I didn't quite understand how many months of training Seaforce had to prepare right. for departures. Can you comment on that? Yes, I can. Um, so it's, Again, complicated. This is gonna be, I'm gonna say the stereotypical historian answer. It's complicated, you know, there's nuance. But in this case, there is because not every member of C Force has the same level of training. Some had enlisted um, right as wars declared, some had been in the interwar army. Uh, so some had been at this for years. The majority of them had years of training. But most of them had the standard requirement of training, um, which was 16 weeks at the time. 
um, doing the basics. Most of them had that, only a small handful didn't have that. Some of them weren't even supposed to be there. They snuck their way in. Um, so it, again, it, it's a complicated one, but some of them have been training for years. This isn't like they were just given a rifle and thrown on the boat. That did not happen. Um, but again, it depends on which unit you're looking at. I mean, the Grenadiers, and again, we couldn't bring it up to time constraints, but Grenadiers were in Jamaica and in a very mountainous part of Jamaica for a good chunk of their garrison duty. And they trained in that hilly terrain, hot, humid, hilly terrain. Sounds like another place, oh, right? <laughs> and, and I discussed with my supervisor at the time, and I uh, at the time, we're pretty sure they're the only Canadian unit who had ever done that. Hmm. So again, it, it, it's complicated. It, it's got nuance, but something like that, I think, is very interesting because everyone's, oh, they're just under train. Maybe they were to select because they're the only ones who had that. I mean, that wasn't the reason, but you know what I mean? And as it comes up, it's like, okay, well, that, that's an interesting way of looking at this because everyone's always there under train. Again, I, I said 1944 because that's usually everyone's frame of reference because of the Normandy landings. Oh, J. Dodger friends get left out of that as well, but, um, but you know what I mean? So it's, it's a different standard as well in 1941. Exactly. Well, I know in the, in the case of my own father, he joined uh, the army in 1939, the day before yeah. Britain declared war on Germany. So so he was an example of someone who actually had more training than, than perhaps many of them. And some of them were First World War veterans. Yeah, yeah exactly. Osborne, Osborne fought in the Naval Division on the Western Front. Exactly. Um, another question. Um, the How did the myths that you've talked about contribute to the treatment of the veterans by Veterans Affairs? So you, you mentioned the fact that, you know, it was a long time before the veterans received compensation. Was this just because of normal government foot dragging or did it was it directly related to uh the these myths that you've you've alluded to yeah so in this situation i will i have to preface it because privacy legislation prohibited me from looking at a good chunk of these documents the veterans affairs documents are not available um, so i couldn't say this is exactly what they said um, i only have publicly available things and what veterans themselves have said but i do believe that it does contribute. Like I said, it starts with King's government. They just want it to go away. So if you keep talking about it, and then it involves, you know, anything that do to that with pension claims and all of that. Like I mentioned that heart disease issue. Um, so many of them in the early, sorry, late 50s, early 60s had died of heart disease. It was almost like a whole bunch of them, all of a sudden veterans just started dying. Mm. You know, the majority of them Veterans Affairs said had nothing to do with their time as POWs, which, as we all know now, not true. I mean, medically, we know that's not true. Um, so I, I think it does have a part and parcel of that because it's a pattern. I'm not saying it's some sort of grand conspiracy, you know, behind doors, but there's patterns here. And I think this is one of them. Veterans Affairs treated them poorly. I've seen the letters that some of them included in their personal files and donations to archives. The answers are not great. I mean, yeah, some of it's government foot dragging because unfortunately that occurs today. It hasn't changed um, in a hundred years. Well, um, whatever it is now, 80 something years that Veterans Affairs officially has existed. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, but I do think these myths contributed in a way. I mean, uh, in both, right? They're self-perpetuating, right? The myths lead to this, which leads to the poor treatment, which led to the myths. You know what I mean? It's it's all connected in and of itself. Prophecy, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, but yes, I, I, I do. But again, that I have to preface that with saying I did not have access to the veterans affairs side of things, yeah, okay. just from the veterans perspective and anything that was public record. Um, all right. Uh, a, a couple of questions about the inquiry that took yeah. place in, in 1942. So first of all, how is it possible to hold an inquiry when there are no, uh, there were no witnesses uh, to what actually took place in Hong Kong. I mean, I can understand uh, the selection and so on and so forth. And once they got on the ship, but after that, there were no witnesses. So first question, how could they even conduct an inquiry given those circumstances? And secondly, was this the only inquiry uh, that Canada uh, ran in uh, for Second World War? Were there other units that had been caught up in this same sort of uh, inquisition? Well, the 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. When you hear that, you're like, well, wait a second. It's, there's a lot of things in the Hong Kong as like stories. Like it's like pause and like wait a minute. This is the big one because yeah, like you said, it doesn't make any sense. How can you do an inquiry into what happens when nobody is there is present? So that's why the inquiry only focused on a few things. Um, spent a long time talking about the loading of ships because that's the only thing they could really do in detail. Um, so, so that's one thing they talk about at length. The training also was done at length because some of the old, um, there was individuals who had, well, there was one defector, not defector, a deserter who was later released for medical reasons. He was present, old CEOs, other people within um, D&D versus themselves. McNaughton was te testified for some reason. Um, he, even he said, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> I had nothing to do with this. So it is, it doesn't make any sense. And and why it happens is politi purely political. King is tired of this. Like I said, I mean, I, I think I put it in my, my dissertation. It's it, conscription, overseas conscription is his sort of Damocles. The sword is constantly hanging over his head, whether it's real or not, to him it's real. So he does anything and everything to avoid that. He wants this to go away because he's tired of, you know, getting bashed in the commons and in the papers right after the words. I mean, George Drew literally writes an article in the Globe and Mail before the battle even ends, published on Christmas Day, 1941, saying you did a terrible job. So he literally wrote it before, before the fall even happens. Yeah. So yeah. yes, there is some merit to this sort of paranoia, but that's why this happens. He wants it to go away as quickly as possible. So this is why he okays it. And the conservatives okay it because Duff is involved because uh, he's Supreme Court justice. They think that it'll all be above board. I think that was a little naivete, naivete by the conservatives at the time, um, but that's how. Um, and, and sorry, the second part was, was there well, other- The second part was, uh, were, was, was Hong Kong the only uh, situation that was investigated by the government? In, in this way, yes. Um, there's a later also Senate investigation that's that's very small and minuscule, barely discusses this at all. Um, and then again, not so later with the whole valor and the horror thing. Um, but no, nothing quite like this. There isn't one on, say, Dieppe, right? The, the twin disasters, if you want to call them that. There was rumblings of doing one, um, but things had moved on past that point. And as the war continued on, Dieppe kind of got lost in the shuffle. Um, whether it would have done any good, I, I don't know. It's all speculative at this point. But no, there's no political fight like this, especially when yeah. Italy happens and because they're happy, right? The, the opposition, so to speak, and that even includes within the Liberal Party, are happy that Canadians are Okay. That's all it seems to matter to some people. So that was the point. So no, that doesn't really happen. Should there have been? Probably. <laughs> Maybe a few things probably could have deserved, a, could have, we could have learned a lot from some inquiries, but unfortunately none happened. Okay. Um, a, a question, actually, a couple of questions concerning the training. Uh, Andrea makes the comment that uh, that her father, while he was in Newfoundland, so he was evidently a royal rifle, was uh, yeah. th that was his only training, and he'd never right. even fired a mortar with real ammunition. Yeah. And, and then Martin uh, from Hong Kong uh, also says that uh, uh, the troops had never seen the two-inch mortar uh, somewhere in the order of 20 to 25 percent had not been trained, so, for example, the 303 Lee Enfield rifle yeah. and the Bren gun. So what, what are your comments on these two? Uh, and these yes, two so, so that's coming back to my earlier one, talking about it's all different levels, right? Um, who has what and who has done what? Um, some of them, not so much. Um, well, yeah, interesting here, because I can see that I see the questions um, from, from Andrea here, uh, speaking about uh, father and she sees she's put lieutenant officer training is a completely different animal than those of the other ranks uh, at the time um, sometimes officer training was rushed um, or non-existent um, but going to things like weapons uh, the two inch mortars no one had seen one they didn't have them things like the 303 training with the three yeah with the lee enfield and the bren gun it's all it's hard because Sorry, I'm sure there are some that may not have, according to the official records, that they didn't. They all had their um, elementary training had been completed. They all had it. Um, Lawson, commander, wrote uh, a diary, very small, um, obviously, because in the fighting, he, he talks about this in this diary. He doesn't say that they're not trained in them. 
He just wants refresher training, which they literally do en route. Um, the 303, you know, the rifles in, into the ocean. Um, and he just wanted everybody to keep up, but he doesn't mention anything about no one ever having any training that, that doesn't come up. But yeah, they didn't have the mortars, but then again, no one in Canada did. Um, uh, like, um, Thompson submachine guns, that's, they see them for the first time, some of them. Um, but yeah, some of them may have not have fired the Bren guns. But again, according to the official records, all of them had that training. Um, could things have been flubbed? It, it's, it's hard to say because this is also not just the Royal Rifles and the Grenadiers, right? They're not up to strength at the time. So they have to have troops added in um, from the Midland Regiment, a good chunk of them come from. And then from the training centers, like they're sweeping through and getting anyone who's willing to volunteer. So were those numbers and things fudged potentially? Um, but again, based on what I could find, as far as I can tell, they all had that elementary level of training. Right. Okay, well, I think we're approaching the end of our time here. Just a couple of comments, uh, not so much questions, but Anne just mentions that her grandfather was a World War I vet and had served with the US Army. And, and uh, she believes that uh, this, this helped her dad to, to survive. So, you know, this mindset, I guess, of the, of the soldier and the experience of the soldier. Right. Um, so, uh, and Vicki asked a question that you, you raised her question actually about the war museum and, and, you know, she's really yes. keen to know what do we have to do to get the war museum <laughs> to, uh, to update their display? Uh, what do you think? That's a difficult one. I'm sure you can tell I've wrestled with that question multiple times internally, externally. Uh, <laughs> I work there. I know people who work there still. Um, World War One the gallery was almost completely redone, uh, particularly Vimy. It can be done. Um, what needs to be done? Last time I asked, I got it literally. That was the answer I got. Uh, I think it's going to take a, more than just me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's going to take Maybe there's an organization out there. Who's well, interested. you know, I guess that's on us to uh, in the HPDCA not, to put some pressure. Yeah, uh, it's, on the it, war museum. So. It's going to take a group effort. Is basically what I'm trying to say. I'm not blaming you guys at all by any means. No, 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 not at all. But you know what I mean. It's it, it's not just enough to you know do individual voices. There has to be a collective voice uh, in something like that because it's happened at the museum multiple times. They've had to change displays because of public pressure or because of representations were just off. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the first things when I started this dissertation, because I hadn't been only been to the War Museum at the old location uh, when I came to Ottawa as a child. So I'd never seen the new one when I got here and, and I read it and I went, well, that's not fair. <laughs> I said, I'm like, well, that's not, that's not okay. And that's been up there since 2005, um, since that place opened. So it's going to take more than, you know, just say like me saying, oh, that's bad. It's going to take people with some positions. <laughs> and well, uh, well, I, I, I thank Vicki for raising the point. And uh, so we'll take that on. And Brad, I hope we can count on your support to uh, of course. Uh, in, in dealing with the War Museum and, and making our point to them. So uh, on that note, I'd like to uh, I'd like to bring the presentation to a close. There were several other comments that people made, and I'm sorry we don't have the time to read them out. Um, but I would like to thank uh, you, Brad, for taking the time to prepare your presentation tonight. Remind everybody that uh, in the next 24 hours, you'll be receiving an email from us, um, which contains a short survey. So please, please, please uh, fill out the survey. It's anonymous. Uh, we do want your input on, uh, on our presentations and also on topics for, for future presentations. So everybody, thanks very much for joining in this evening. As you know, our mission is to educate Canadians on the Battle of Hong Kong and on the effect of its on, a, on its effects on survivors and their families. And I hope that you found this and our previous virtual events uh, have contributed to supporting that mission. And don't forget, and somebody did ask this question, how can I watch this presentation? Please go to www.hkvca.ca and you will find tomorrow uh, not tonight, tomorrow, a link to this presentation, which you can watch at any time. So everybody, thank you very much for joining. Thanks again, Brad, and have a great trip uh, to the Netherlands. And thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Thank you.